Figure it out. Hello, this is Adam Corlick from Figure It Out Productions. The following video is a video of some kind, and I hope you enjoy it. Hey everyone, welcome to the Figure It Out cast for, what is it, it's already June 2024. Uh, I'm your host, Adam Corlick, and I am joined by the immortal, the indestructible, the superior, Joseph Camberino. <laughs> welcome back, Joseph. Hi, Adam. Thanks for having me. Glad to know I'm immortal. That immortal. Yeah, you're. <laughs> yeah, no problem. I'm glad I could help you with that. Um, <laughs> so, that's actually a Patreon perk now. But in all reality, so first of all, thank you everybody who's listening. If uh, you could do us a favor, please like this, comment down below, subscribe if you've never done that before, and of course check out all the social media stuff in the description. We've got you know Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Discord, obviously Patreon and Spreadshirt, my travel channel. But speaking of Patreon, though, I do want to say thank you to everybody who is a Patreon backer, and of course anybody who's considering joining because you can get early access to this, other videos, you can get things like shout outs on this podcast you can pick subjects and much like joseph you can actually be on it so joseph thank you very much as always for being a returning champion um so as a subject uh, backer well, as a patreon backer who gets to be on here of course you as always get to pick a subject and as sometimes you do you decided not to bother with it which is totally fine <laughs> so we pick something on your behalf yeah the only um, thing i could have thought of i didn't think would actually make a good subjects for the show considering you would be just your response would be so like yeah okay because <laughs> you you wouldn't have well, any now i'm curious at all um basically it, basically um with that case um bethesda released the mod tools for starfield and there are paid mods in there some of them by bethesda and it's causing people to be a little bit yeah about it but since you don't generally do downloadable content and as far as i know you haven't played Starfield and don't have time to really play video games. I didn't know how much of a <laughs> thought process you you could actually give to that. So, uh, yeah, I have no specific insights to the situation with Starfield. I do apologize, but everyone out there who is super into it, you are lucky. You have Joseph in your corner fighting for your rights to party or something. No, nothing. All right, let's yeah. move on. <laughs> okay, all right, for realsies. Um, yeah, so on your behalf, we just kind of picked something else. Um, I so I, you may not know this, or maybe you did. Uh, I've effectively been in the UK for like a month. Um, I'm now back at home. Uh, there was a little break where I had to come back in between, but effectively I was over there for like five, six weeks, which is like ridiculous. Um, so in that time, you know, I started because I was there for so long. I started, you know, I went to game stores and all that kind of thing, and I started thinking a lot more about, like, what video games were like for them growing up as opposed to us. And one thing that really kind of caught my attention, and I know you're obviously a, uh, a PC gamer and maybe even some, to some extent, retro PC gaming. Um, the question before us is, do you think it's better or worse that gaming is now globally consistent? And just to explain that question, in the 1980s, uh, gaming globally was, there was, it was like chaos. So, you know, Japan, of course, you know, you had Sega to a lesser extent with, you know, the SG-1000 and you had Nintendo with the Famicom kind of reshaping what that was. There was also a whole bunch of systems that came out there that we never got things by like Bandai and even Casio and just like, you, you get it. They're, like I've done videos on some of these things, just these obscure systems that came and went in just one country. In North America, we were largely dominated by Atari and Coleco and all that stuff until the video game crash um, in North America. But in, in Europe, and especially the UK, they were dealing with things like the ZX Spectrum and Amiga PC hardware. And my point is, it wasn't consistent from region to region. You had like tons of different companies trying tons of different strategies, whereas I would argue really after the NES... Uh, it kind of got somewhat more uniform. And now we're at a point where like every Western country always expects the same systems. It's an Xbox system. It's a PlayStation system and a Nintendo brand system. And I'm just curious, like the plus minus is really just what I wanted to discuss here. Like, what do you think is better? Uh, what do you think is worse? You know, I'm just curious, like, what do you think about any of that? Yeah, no, it's a, it, it's a pretty interesting question. Like, and now that I know that you specifically are denoting cons where things started to get consistent as after the NES, the question also makes a lot more sense to me now. Like, it was like, yes. I mean, all the stuff, ex I mean, granted, even back during, like, the NES and Sega Genesis days, Europe was still, like, pretty heavily PC gaming hardware with not the PC as we know it today, but, like, stuff with, like, Commodore and stuff like that. 
Mm -hmm. Um, But, yeah, but I mean, back then, yeah, we were getting a lot of stuff, consoles and stuff, at least, like, from Japan. And a lot of the games we were getting brought over, like, obviously, were heavily altered much more than stuff is now to better fit America. But we're still getting the same stuff. But on one hand, yeah, I definitely do agree, do think that's probably better that things are globally consistent, especially in the day, of, in, in the age of, you know, the internet being a thing. Um, because, like, a lot of, like, there were a lot of gamers who were very into, like, JRPGs back in the day, like, back during, like, the PlayStation era. And the way to get, like, some of the games was pretty painful, especially since the internet was a thing, so we knew the games existed. And it's like, when are we going to get this? And I don't want to know anything about what's going to happen. Stop posting stuff about what happened in the game because you imported it and you somewhat read Japanese. Stop spoiling shit. Whereas now we bet we generally get most of the stuff around the same time. So that's that's definitely better. But on the other hand, you could think of it by the thought process of that. Yeah, we get everything at the same time, but things are also a lot less distinct than they used to be like you could at least like in older like with like say with europe like say with the uk if you get a game from the uk from like back during the nes sega master system era era and it was you would probably be able to tell that okay yeah this is a british game or a uk game nowadays like if a game is made in like the uk or made in spain or made in basically any country it's still designed, for the most part, for a global audience. Um, so it's basically like, yeah, okay, I, unless if the game is specifically meant to be about the culture of the co- of the country it's about, you're, you'd have a hard time telling, in general, that it it's from X country. Like, at least, at least, like, 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 a lot, like even if, even with, like, some of the anime-type games... And by anime type, I mean games that are in, like, the anime art style, not games that are tie-ins to a- actual anime. Like, you could you could see one of those, and that might be from an indie developer in the U.S., or it might be from a company in the U.S. now, because of how long anime has been around here. So. That's, a, that's actually a really good take on all that. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, because part, partially what got me thinking about all that... <clears throat> is um when i go over to either japan or parts of europe etc um and i'm like looking to you know collect some video games right i rarely have any reason to get a game that's available here because that just doesn't make sense right like i wouldn't go in and buy like oh look i can buy a, a copy of halo it's like well we have that so the only reason you pick something up there is either A, if it's like a brand or a franchise you really care about. So like in my case, you know, the Shenmue games, I had to have it from every region, whatever. But usually you just focus on the exclusive stuff. And in the current generation, uh, I think that the Xbox One, for example, which isn't even current anymore, a system that came out in 2013, so 11 years. Are you aware there's only one physical exclusive xbox one game in japan literally one i was not aware Um, but it makes sense it's called azito i actually have it i got it years ago um and it's it's literally the only one which makes it not a very interesting system to try and do stuff with that for but the further back in time you go not only do you have more regional exclusives for systems that you care about like gamecube i think had like 80 japanese releases something like that that we never got um, and then there's a little bit of spoilers, but they, in Europe, they had like 10 GameCube releases that we didn't get. I, I just picked up the last one. So I finished it effectively. Oh, cool. Congrats. Um, <laughs> yeah, it is cool. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll show it on the playload episode. Um, but yeah, so I managed to get that and that's, that's kind of the fun of hunting for something like that. But as you can tell over the generations, it starts to thin out more and more. But where it gets more interesting is the further back you go, you get entire consoles we never got. So, like, in my videos, the number one and two system I'm looking for games for, even though they're objectively not very good consoles, is the Commodore Amiga CD32, a system that famously never came out in the U.S., though it did come out in Canada. Um, 
we just never got it. So finding any games for it is effectively impossible here. So that makes it kind of challenging and interesting. And to think that Commodore was such a big success story from their PCs in, in Europe that they thought, okay, we can also make a home console and have it work. Like that whole story to me is fascinating because as an American, you'd never even like heard of this. Whereas there's other systems like the Amstrad GX4000, which I was also looking for games for. That is, it was a British company actually. And that system actually found more success in France than it did anywhere else. But that said, it did come out in the UK. So it's like, that's what I'm looking for. But I'm not looking for, again, games I can easily get at home. Uh, all my point is, is the further back you go, the more diverse it gets. And over time, it's been the consolidation of media and consolidation of game systems and uh, infrastructures that makes it in some obviously makes it easier like everyone's going to make the case and they're correct to do so that it's vastly more financially responsible and you know economically logical if you will to only have a few choices because you then don't have to buy like 47 different consoles to get like every game that you're interested in that's completely a rational argument however i would argue it is a tad more interesting when you have so many variations on hardware that the potential for different oddities you would otherwise never have been able to experience exists. Um, you know, like, uh, obviously, I'm not into the, the PC side of stuff, but you, you said it yourself. In the 80s, especially in the UK, they were kind of tinkering with all these, like, gaming PC rigs that really were just effectively gaming PCs. They really didn't do anything else. Uh, all that well, combo I mean, they stuff could, but, stuff. I mean, a lot we, of people yeah, who but, talk about them talk about the games on them. Because right, well, I mean, which makes yeah, sense. Because right. I mean, like, why would you talk about the word processors and capabilities of a of a retro Commodore system when every computer had a word processor? Precisely. So effectively, their only remaining remnant of any interest is their gaming section, which was relatively unique for each platform. So when I would go into these game stores, you know, there'd be like entire walls of just games for these variations of different type of retro gaming PCs I've never even heard of. And then it's like, it's games and franchises you know, but just on a system you've never seen. Like, you know, Outrun by Sega for the Amstrad CPC. And you're just like, that's cool. What else, what other stuff did they make? Even though that particular version is terrible. Um, but some of the people over there were explaining it. It's like they had so many of these different gaming PCs that it, they've even had like different budget tiers. So it's like if you were rich, you could get this one. If you were middle class, you could get this one. If you were poor, you could get this one. And um, yeah, it, it just to me just came off as very fascinating that you would have so many different unique pieces of hardware. And I do find that interesting. And I, and to an extent, I find it more compelling than anything we do now. But at the same time it's impossible to make a legitimate case that you wish there was that many different pieces of competitive hardware. Yeah. So really, I'm just, I really, I'm just wondering like, is it actually better in every sense or did, no. did we trade convenience for charm? You know what I mean? Like we, 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 took we, we definitely did limit it. Like okay, ideally so the best situation for this whole thing to go with would be, to go where we have now with, like, the consoles and PCs where it's, like, vaguely unified with, like, a few options like Xbox, PlayStation, and um, Nintendo plus, you know, PC, which is still generally Windows. Yes, I know. Yeah, yes, more PC gamers. I know Linux exists, um, but generally most game gaming PCs are running Windows still, even with things like the Steam Deck being a thing. Um, but... Ideally, what we would have is have the have the platforms that we have now, but have more like unique games coming out at like even at the AAA price points. Like say, a ga games like coming out of Spain being explicitly like j explicitly being made to be Spanish culture games that we could in theory like get to to experience. As opposed to like everything just having to do the unified th niche that they have now, where it's like, yeah, every game, regardless of where it's made, is made to appeal to basically America, Japan, or both. Yeah, that I would make the case that you're definitely right about that one because obviously Europe is not a country, so it doesn't really. It's often blanketed as one by people who are not from there. Mm -hmm. um, but really, there's only two markets where 
there are countries that make video games that make specifically for their own market. And that's, of course, the United States and Japan. And it's not really coincidence that those are the only two countries that even make game consoles anymore. Uh, Japan, of course, being Sony and Nintendo, and U.S. having Microsoft. Yeah. Um, it, where is Valve based? U.S.? Yeah, they're in, they're in the U.S. I think they're in Seattle. There you go. Yeah, well, there you go. Uh, Microsoft is, too, so that says a lot. Um, oh, yeah. As is Nintendo, funny enough. They're American office. Um, but... So, yeah, the Europeans, I think, get a little shafted because they basically just have to do game development, which is fine. Their money is always appreciated. But I have to imagine it's kind of hard for them to make a game that's very much considered intended for a local audience outside of a couple of nods. Like you still or, in, get... or a few in, or like the indie games, like an indie game sure. can much more easily justify the budget to do that than, say, you know, a big budget game nowadays. Absolutely, but I'll still bet you those indie games you're talking about are still going to get dumped onto somewhere like Steam or Xbox. You know, game. Oh yeah, no, I'm, I'm not. I'm not saying that the game that the game shouldn't come out in other regions. That would be ludicrous. But exactly. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I guess uh, to summarize all this, I think it's probably generally good for the consumer that we have some consolidation here, so you don't have so many. Uh, potential failures but i do think it's a loss as far as cultural charm and the potential for different creation um creativity took a bit of a hit i guess is what i would say yeah. with that but uh at the same time if you want to make a prosumer argument to that too having more choice theoretically drives down prices but i think there was too much choice which is what caused the crash in north america anyway so you know there's a balance i guess is the way you have to put it so yep. yeah um anything else you want to say on this uh, not really i think i pretty much covered it okay then we're gonna move on so joseph thank you for that subject you didn't really pick it you really <laughs> did very well You're welcome <laughs> um so our next subject here comes from Lodmot, who is a new backer uh who canonically in my server lore discord is the wealthiest human being who has ever existed um, but that said, he is very generously decided to start picking subjects and he wanted us to talk about the concept of a Dreamcast mini, uh, and what we would expect versus what we would want. Now to be very clear on this, this is not some news story. In fact, I did a video a couple weeks ago at the time I'm recording this, um, about how there is kind of an, an update that basically says there is no update with Sega and minis. Uh, that they know we want them, but they're just not really ready to do anything else and that they're effectively not working on anything just yet, which basically my interpretation is based on that, as well as having worked with them in the past, is when they can do it for a cost-effective reason or cost-effective uh, budget, uh, then you might see them, but they're just not there yet. So, and that would include things like the Saturn and the Dreamcast. The Master System is a different case because they probably could do that like any time now. They just choose not to because it could really only work in Europe. Yeah. Um, but that said, so focusing specifically on a hypothetical Dreamcast Mini, um, I'm going to put it to you. What would you want to see in it, like in a fantasy world, and then in a reality, what would you expect out of it? Okay, so as someone who didn't grow up owning a Dreamcast, um, and who has one now and doesn't really play it all that often, to be honest, um, what I would want out of, of Dreamcast Mini as like a pie-in-the-sky thing would be basically a box with a really accurate, really good emulator that has every single first-party Sega game for the Dreamcast on it. What I expect is that we'd get something that's just like basically run in an Android box that can do a somewhat okay uh, Dreamcast emulator, or like as you mentioned, like basically just a thing that's just having all of the Dreamcast games that got ported to PC or Xbox 360 on there, and that's it. Which would suck because, like, for most of those, I think all of them have like some issues. Like, rather infamously, as far as the Sonic fan base is concerned, all of the Sonic Adventure and the Sonic Adventure 2 ports are kind of shit. So, <laughs> yep. With like but with like bugs and with like bugs like I I think the Dreamcast version of Sonic Adventure is the only one that had like one of those that invisible chameleon enemy that actually, you know, worked. Like even in the GameCube version it like appears and then disappears immediately and that's it. It doesn't do anything as opposed to, you know, what it's supposed to do which is, you know, attack you because it's an enemy. And stuff like that. So, 
Yeah, I mean, I'm in, I'm inclined to agree. If they were to do that, like right now, sure. I think that um, Sega would prefer to do a proper Dreamcast Mini and not just like those cheap PC collections. Because if that was the case, they could have done it already. True. They've chosen not to. Um, in again, this goes back to 2018, so six years ago. I remember having a call with some people over there, and they basically explained that was the problem. It's just the technology wasn't there to do it correctly. And then I threw out a couple of questions at them, and they kind of con- confirmed what I was thinking. But basically, one of the things about the Dreamcast that is a problem, and it doesn't get talked about a whole lot, is that when Sega was producing the Dreamcast, they were in a really tight financial spot. A large part of the that era was actually funded by some Japanese billionaire who, like, the week after he died, Sega had to basically stop production because they ran out of his... Basically, basically, angel investor money. I thought it was the um, other way around. They decided they. I thought that they stopped, decided to stop making consoles exclusively, and then he died. I'm pretty sure he died like a week before that. I think oh, it was he okay. died first, and then they made the announcement. Um, I mean, I, I I'm not looking at that in front of me, but I'm pretty sure that's how it went. Okay, and honestly, way, most the, of the, all my memory of this is like from your videos, honestly. So, well, I, I appreciate that. I could be. Wrong. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, that's we could. Yeah, hell, I could be wrong. We could both be wrong. But um, the point is that Sega was very cash strapped. So one of the things they did during the Dreamcast era is a lot of corporate tie-ins in the games. So like Crazy Taxi is a great example of this. They they you know the characters want you to get to like a Pizza Hut. Okay, well there's a reason Pizza Hut's in there. They were willing to pay for the advertising. Uh, Shenmue, for example, uh, the Japanese version had Coca-Cola vending machines. Uh, the final version had Timex watches. Now, when they re-release these games, they can't put any of that stuff in there. So it requires them to go back to source code and remove them, uh, which is a pain and an expense. But if you're going to do a proper Dreamcast collection that's purely emulated, well, then you can't make those changes unless you effectively go back into source code, change it within Dreamcast source code, and then re-export it as Dreamcast source code, and then put it into an emulator anyway, which seems kind of stupid. Um, but I mean, maybe there's a logic to that. I'm not entirely sure, but either way, the experiences that would come of it would be different and you'd still have to pay teams to go back in and fix that stuff. Um, and that's like the, that's like the beginning of your problems. Um, and because part of the, the other issue with that is things like crazy taxi again, exposed this too, is because they had like offspring for their music, like that band, they couldn't re up the license on that. So and I think most people make case Crazy Taxi without offspring is not Crazy Taxi anymore. It's just like a totally different game at that point. Um, so yeah. licensing is going to be an issue with pretty much anything that's mainstream Dreamcast related. Uh, I don't think there are any. To be honest, I don't think there are like any major Sega Dreamcast titles that would get out completely unscathed. I think some would have a little bit of a less of an issue, like Sonic Adventure One, probably not so bad. But like Sonic Adventure Two had like corporate tie-ins with the type of shoes Sonic. Would oh have. God, I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So like, it, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff like that that you'd have to kind of deal with. Um, and honestly, it's easier to just never do it. Now. That's also assuming the technology was there and the money was there to make that work correctly. The other issue is the Dreamcast controller. Now, when I bring that up, a lot of people hear that and they go, oh, it's because the Dreamcast controller is bad. I don't like it. It's a weird design, blah, blah, blah. I've always said the Dreamcast controller was great for the games it was designed for, but everybody kind of looks at it like, why didn't they make it more like the PlayStation controller? Well, because the DualShock PlayStation controller had only been out, like, what, six months yeah. <laughs> into the time the Dreamcast was in development. Um, it wasn't even close to the industry standard yet to have an ergonomic controller with two thumbsticks. So the Dreamcast just kind of got historically a little screwed by that, but that's just how it went. So do you keep the original design, which so many people apparently just have decided they don't like anymore? Do you redesign it? And once you do redesign it, because you probably have to to some extent, how do you handle VMUs? Um, if you're going to make a wireless Dreamcast controller, we've learned from the wireless ones that do exist, uh, the third-party ones, that it's they, the VMU basically guzzles battery. And it's probably not smart to use like an actual VMU. So do you have it powered, you know, like do you have it powered with a battery and then it still provides a screen? You know, do you do that and then just chew away at the battery? Or do you make it wired so that the screen can work? Like, you understand what I'm saying? The yeah. VMU is a problem. 
Um, because even if you want to brought like, you know, the VMU is also where the save states are, right? So like when uh, retro fighters had to address this, they had to create a little dongle that plugged into the console directly because they basically came to the conclusion that sending memory card saves over a wireless Dreamcast controller when the system wasn't designed for that, like a Bluetooth signal. Oh God! It was highly susceptible to save file corruption, which they figured was vastly more annoying than not being able to see that screen, yeah. which is fair. Um, and so, how would Sega deal with that? So in my ideal scenario, uh, which is even semi-realistic, you would do proper Dreamcast emulation. Uh, They would put on probably about 20 titles is what I think you could maybe get away with. Um, I think it would be cool if you put in something that was unreleased uh, and finally getting an official release. And I think the only one really up to snuff on that is Propeller Arena. Uh, it was a Dreamcast game made by Yu Suzuki's team that was completely finished and even translated into English. Like, it was 100% done. And then because of uh, the nature of the game is you're playing with a lot of planes and you fly around in cities, and there's even one called Tower City. Oh, uh, dear. You get it. <laughs> you can fly planes into buildings. Um, just before the release, 9-11 happened, and all of a sudden it was like, nope, there's no way we are going to deal with the PR of releasing this. And they just never got it back around to it. So it's, it's never been officially released. It has been dumped online from prototype copies, but seeing an officially released one would be great. Now, I don't know if you ever saw the Sega Genesis 2 Mini. Um, I do. That thing, I was a lot, that thing was a lot better than people gave it credit for, because when you look at it, your initial impression is, oh, really? Another Genesis collection? How awesome. Um, but in reality, not only was it a bunch of Genesis stuff that they hadn't put on the first one, they also put on a bunch of Sega CD stuff, and very interestingly, they also included a bunch of unreleased games. They actually took the time to finish, which I thought was insane. Like they had apparently been sitting on a bunch of Genesis stuff they had just never quite completed, and they put it there. Same with some Sega CD stuff that only exists officially in that form. And it's not impossible to think that if that team cared that much, that a Dreamcast version of the same idea is possible. So, ideally, I would like to see a Dreamcast Mini probably in. price range. I don't really think you can get it any cheaper than that, to be completely frank. Um, Consisting of maybe 20 games, uh, hopefully actually Dreamcast emulated versions. Uh, You may have no choice but to go back into the Dreamcast source code and remove certain elements, again, like corporate tie-ins, which is easier said than done. Um, But if you can do that and then throw in at least one thing like Propeller Arena that's truly unique to that machine in an official sense, I think that would be great. Um, It's impossible and totally unrealistic to ever think that you would get like a full Dreamcast set on there or anything. Oh, yeah. So that would be what I would want. What I would expect is actually not that far off um, just because I, I think that if Sega was willing to do just a crappy job on it, they would have already done it. That's fair. Uh, yeah, so uh, I don't. I'm not too worried about that. I don't. I don't think they're too likely to throw out in like 2026. Be like, all right, the Dreamcast Mini is finally here, and it's just a bunch of crappy PC ports. Hey, yay! <laughs> I just. I don't think they would do that. Um, Cause like you know that that I. I don't know. I think that that's their. I think yeah, the like the only way that would their, happen is if Sega ended yeah. up like rush it. If Nintendo did something like say an N sixty four or more likely a GameCube Mini at some point, yeah. and then Sega was like, "Okay, shit, we need a Dreamcast Mini out," <laughs> and then rush. So how I do- I really doubt that would motivate them that much, to be honest with you. Um, well, I mean, I, that, that's probably the only way we end up with the crappy one. Now that I think. Oh yeah, <laughs> there would have to be some other reason. Like, literally, if Nintendo put out the N64 Mini and it just went gangbusters and Nintendo brought back the whole Mini concept to the forefront, Mm -hmm. then, yeah, maybe Sega would, you know, slapdash one together. But I would hope in that situation they would be like, let's be smarter about this and put out, like, I don't know, the Master System Mini first. You know, something we know we can do correctly without... I I mean, yeah, that's likely what would happen because if they were going to make the... Like, they were originally going to go with At Games for the... Sega Mini until everyone complained. Yeah. I was like, uh, "At Games sucks. Your, your their Sega stuff, their Sega Genesis stuff is is crap." And then they Sega looked at it and was like, "Oh yeah, crap. You're right. Okay, we're not going to do that." So the fact yeah, that they their, did the, the fact that the Sega Genesis Minis were not crap probably points to them not falling into that trap. 
Yeah, I, I mean, initially they just looked at it as a simple licensing thing until they realized this meant more to people than that. Um, so, I don't know. I, I, I don't think even an N64 Mini kind of going ape would make them be like, okay, yeah, let's do a Dreamcast Mini immediately. I think more likely at that point they would do... Um, I would actually, one thing I think that would be kind of cool is if they took the Sega CDX design and released another mini in that form, you put more Genesis on it, obviously you put way more Sega CD on it, but you also put on a whole bunch of 32 X stuff. I think that would be kind of cool. Um, I just, the problem is always going to be the same for the other systems. It's the master system really would only do well in Europe, which I don't know why they haven't done that by the way, because that one would be easy. Um, they, they probably figured they'd get enough backlash for only releasing it in Europe that they that see, it would be that it would feel that would that would be bad to the brand to do it, but it's not worth it enough to actually do it in any other country. The, the, you're probably right. There's some sort of cost cost plus minus and you know uh, logic there, but I mean honestly, they already have the answer to that one. So you can do a wide release in Europe. But at the same time, you do, like, literally a limited run games, limited run of it, you know, 5,000 units. That's more than enough of the North American base that's going to care. Like, let's be real. Yeah. And Japan probably genuinely wouldn't care. You could release it over there as, like, a special edition that looks like the Sega Mark III, and maybe a few hundred people would get it. Like, it, And that's, that's fine. If anything, you'd be more likely to get diehard Sega fans importing that one just because it's different. Um I think they would be fine on that. The cost of, you know, emulating Master System is is nothing at this point. I mean, technically, they've already done it when they did the Game Gear minis. Um, yeah. But whatever. The Saturn is its own huge problem as far as, like, finding source code and everything. And the fact that everything on that system is pretty unique. So I, I don't know about that one. But at least with the, the Dreamcast, you know, you, you kind of understand the problems. Um, and I think that it, it's probably going to happen at some point. It's just a matter of the technology getting there. But I agree with you that it wouldn't hurt if somebody lit a fire under them for some other in some other way. Again, if Nintendo did an N64 Mini or something. But I'll tell you right now, Nintendo has no reason to do that. No. You have to remember, the NES and SNES classics were born of the reality that Nintendo's Wii U was a flop and they needed something to sell you. Yeah, and the Switch uh, was either not ready or Nintendo couldn't release it at, at earlier than they did because it would have hurt the brand too much. Precisely. that, And now that that is successful... There's a reason they stop caring. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, that's, that's really all there is to it. So, yeah, I guess unless you have anything else to say about it, uh, I guess we're done with this. Yeah, not, re like the, not really. Like, the only thing I could bring up is that, yeah, it would have, like, the only way for someone to, like, light a fire under Sega's ass to do another mini would be Nintendo. And that's it. Like, Sony's not going to do another one. The one they did, they screwed up. So... <laughs> Like, horribly yeah. yeah plus ps2 has the same pretty much the same issue as the dreamcast as far as cost effectiveness goes yeah so yeah we're, we're just not at a point i mean here's the thing so like i did that video like a couple weeks ago talking about that and a lot of people be like oh they could totally do it i have this retro pie and it can play this and i only bought it for this like yeah, you bought it as an end consumer. You're not thinking about all the production side of things that go into that. You're not thinking about all the legal side of things. Like you're playing them somewhat illegitimately through pre-existing ROMs that don't have to deal with licensing issues. It's not the same as them having to make all the hardware in-house, package it all up, distribute it, market it, and of course right. generate all the Possibly software. Possibly write their own emulators if they're not able to use right. any of the open source ones because of licenses. Precisely. The irony is, you know, amazing there. So, yeah, you get it. So, like, it's, it's, I think it's just not quite there. And the problem is the further along we go, while the technology and cost effectiveness perhaps gets there, the desire goes down. And so it's like this weird trade off where if you want this, you can still have it, but we just, you basically just have to kind of still push the narrative publicly that you want it because otherwise you'll lose interest. Um, I still maintain, I think they'll do at least one of them at some point. Uh, if they do a Dreamcast Mini first, I can almost guarantee you they're never touching Saturn or Master System, though. Oh, yeah, for um, sure. Yeah. So, whatever. Um, but we'll yeah, see. Like, Time will tell. Nintendo or Sega are the only companies that are going to viably do another one of these. 
at all. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a little shocked there was never a good Neo Geo one. I mean, I know there was like a little arcade type of one, but like, like just someone making one that looks like a little tiny AES that isn't the Neo Geo X that actually just runs well. I'm a little surprised we never got that, but you know, yeah, that's, that's, it's a bit too late for that one now, unless if the mini craze comes up again, though. Oh, I guarantee you, though, even if that one ever got made, it would be Japan only. Um, yeah. I, 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 I don't see how that would ever come out here. I'm, I'm still shocked we actually got the Turbo Graphics Mini. That was kind of an amazing one to get, but oh well. I guess Konami figured that, well, we own the Turbo Graphics stuff now. We might as well put it out and see what happens. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know how that thing performed ultimately, but. Neither do I. Yeah. All right, anything else on this? Nope, I'm good. All right, well then, thank you very much to Lodmot for that particular subject. Now we're going to move on here. We have a round of shout-outs. The following people are all Patreon backers in which, uh, at the tier in which they get a shout-out. So we've got Loke, Michael Kelly, Sega Steve, and Trey Wagner. Once again, that is Loke, Michael Kelly, Sega Steve, Trey Wagner. Thank you so much for all of your support. We could not do this without you. And we are back. We are now joined by Abdullah. Welcome back, dude. Hey, happy to be back with as much energy as possible. We appreciate that. It's been a minute since you were here. You had some issues last time. I think you were yeah, here two months ago, though. But yeah, yeah it's, it's I good that you're back. Last podcast. Thank you. And uh, yeah, yeah. Kind of miss Rob, but okay. Yeah, <laughs> I tried to get him. He's he's doing other people's podcasts now. He's like a a music yeah. podcast music. slut now. You yeah, know, I, I saw a us. clip of that. Uh, I, I did see a clip of that. I felt betrayed, but it's fine. So did I, actually, so did I. to tell you the truth. Um, I mean, if Danny I felt Ron. betrayed, imagine what. Imagine what you would feel. Come on. Oh, it was awful. It was the worst, but I made fun of him, so it's fine. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started here. So uh, you can, uh, we, I was talking to you, obviously, and you get to pick a subject. You didn't really have one in mind, but you had kind of hit on this idea of doing something around the Game Boy Advance. And there's another Patreon backer whose name is Sinjeet. He also did not have a subject, but he tends to like us to talk about alternative history. Like, what if this console failed? What if this console succeeded? What would have happened? And I thought it'd be kind of fun to kind of mesh those two together and basically ask the question on behalf of both of you. Alternative history. What would happen if the Game Boy Advance had failed? Now, let me set this up a little bit, shall I? So, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Um, people have got to remember that uh, when Nintendo released the Game Boy Advance, effectively... Uh, they had dominated the handheld market, obviously, with the original Game Boy. They released the Game Boy Color kind of late, but it was it was never really considered its own separate system, although now it kind of is. Uh, but at the time, it was seen as almost like a pro model of the Game Boy. But effectively, they went without a new handheld for like 14 years. It was, it was really quite something, because I think the original Game Boy launched in like 1989, and then the Game Boy Advance was like 2003. Like, it's, it's a surprisingly long gap um, 2003 or, or, or I think it was 2001 or 2001. 2001 2001 in Japan I believe 2001 yeah, so essentially we have a like, yeah so it's like year 11 kind of year gap, gap. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So basically a decade and then some, a decade and change between handhelds um, which is pretty significant back then because Console generations, and granted those are handhelds, are back then were like four years. It, it really wasn't, you know, that was kind of insane. That was almost two and a half generations of yeah, time. In the decade, you got two. four, fifth, and sixth generations. Yeah, so exa exactly. So when the Game Boy launched, the third generation was still relevant. The second, or uh, the fourth generation had started. But by the time the Game Boy Advance came out, we were well into the sixth generation of game consoles. Like, it was a pretty significant time span. Um, so, uh, and that's ignoring, of course, the Virtual Boy, which was right there in the middle. So the question I, I kind of pose is, what if the Game Boy Advance had come out and had failed, similar to the Virtual Boy? Now, I want to preface this by saying, obviously it didn't. We know that. And it clearly wasn't going to. But it's just kind of interesting to discuss how history might have unfolded. Um, and I think the first and most obvious casualty is that if you remember where Nintendo was at the time, uh, the GameCube was not a big hit. Yeah, even though the GameCube is great, and I know you love it, I love it, Rob obviously loves it. Um, if you remember in that generation, Nintendo kind of leaned heavily on the Game Boy Advance. Uh, in fact, that's why they made the Game Boy Player and all that sort of stuff. 
and it's it, it uh, if if it hadn't succeeded, I don't know where Nintendo would have gone. I think the Wii probably still would have happened, but I don't know if there would have been any sort of Game Boy successor. I also don't know if Sony would have ever bothered with the PSP. What do you think? Okay, so uh, I was going to mention pretty much the same thing because it, uh, regarding the GameCube because GameCube didn't do so well uh, sales-wise. I mean, as you said, uh, I love it. We, we all love the GameCube. Uh, but but still, it was you would consider it a flop compared to something like the Wii. Uh, now, Nintendo, uh, as you all, all obviously know, that the, the, in handhelds they've been the dominant uh, player in it. And uh, it's interesting to see what would have happened if the Game Boy Advance didn't succeed. Now, what I was interested, what, what, what I thought was interesting is because some people might actually, you know, kind of think that the Game Boy Advance wasn't that successful, successful because if you consider the time frame the DS was released, right? So DS was, DS what, was like released 2004? 2004, something like that. So, so that's like a three-year difference. And compare that to the 10-year-plus gap of yeah, the yeah, Game Boy, yeah, yeah. you might think that it wasn't successful. But as you said, and as it's clear, it was a very successful console. Now, you said, and now I had a different uh, approach when it came to the Sony part of it, because you said that maybe Sony wouldn't have bothered. It could have been a possibility, but I also think that Sony could have utilized the chance... Because we all know that the PSP is obviously technically more superior than something like the Game Boy Advance. But uh, I think they would have jumped that chance, probably used it, maybe the PSP would have been more successful compared to uh, compared to uh, how it was relative to the Game Boy Advance. I also think that, uh, you know, it's interesting to see because because you we all know that Nintendo handhelds have been successful in general. I mean, excluding the Virtual Boy, which some people may actually think was not a handheld, but but it, it technically, technically is, handheld. but yeah. technically considered, <laughs> yeah, but technically is, but realistically isn't. Uh, so so I I would think that even if it did suffer or didn't succeed, Nintendo would have already had the DS in mind somehow, or would have gone through with the DS, kind of like how Nintendo saved itself from the Wii U situation, which, like the GameCube, unfortunately, is a great console in my opinion, but didn't get the success it, it deserved. I think they would have jumped towards the DS, or DS-like kind of thing, but maybe without a Game Boy Advance support. Something like that. I think that they would have been able to save themselves in the handheld market, but at the same time, it would have caused an impact on the console side because we all know that GameCube wasn't doing so well. So, yeah, I think yeah, they would have been able to save themselves a bit, but then again, the, 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 the opportunity for Sony, and not even Sony, it could be that Microsoft would have, would have jumped into it. Who knows? That's something you might want to think about. Because if Nintendo had the, the, if there was a gap where Nintendo was super dominant, especially in the handheld market, I kind of see Sony and Microsoft and maybe other others trying to, you know, take that share of Nintendo. So it was a critical time, so it would have caused you know, a whole like domino effect kind of thing. Yeah, no, I'm. I'm inclined to agree with your assessment. So let's let's kind of branch off the the key points. Obviously, if the Game Boy Advance had flopped, the first casualty of that other than the system itself would have been the GameCube to an extent. Now, we live in a reality where the GameCube was largely aided by the Game Boy Advance, not only with the link cable and, you know, cross compatibility with some games between both systems uh, with bonus features and the like. Um, it also had the Game Boy Player capabilities, which was admittedly a really big uh, selling point for the GameCube in a lot of regards. And even in our reality, that didn't do amazing. So without it, that would be a far rarer, odder piece of kit that probably would be very, very expensive to have now, assuming it never even got released, um, which it very likely would not have had the system, uh, the GBA in particular, had it Virtual Boy level flopped. I don't think they would have even bothered making that. Could um, have been just maybe Japan kind of only. Yeah, maybe. It's 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 hard to say. It, it, we're talking like if it's literally Virtual Boy numbers, um, which was, yeah, we're talking like Virtual Boy numbers. 
Um, again, that's just hype. That's just a hypothetical. Obviously, it's all alternative history. Who knows why this would have been, uh, happened? Who knows? Magic Genie said it had to fail. I don't know, but for what the the situation is, it failed. Um, so with that. Uh, your secondary casualty would have to be the GameCube would probably take a much bigger hit. And I'm wondering how bad it would have been. Because I think the GameCube ultimately sold like 22 million units, which was not actually very good for them. Uh, it came in third out of five, technically, uh, only beating out the Dreamcast and the new one, which is probably still where it would have ended up. But it probably would have been closer to, I don't know. I mean, how many people do you think bought a GameCube for GBA support. Like how many millions? Can we maybe credit a couple million with that? What do you think? What do you think? Well, I think not as much because if you if you're gonna buy a game you to play GBA, it doesn't make any sense. But it would make sense the the the, the uh, to, to buy just a Game Boy, right? Why would I buy well, a whole well, system? If it was the, more of a if you had a GameCube, then it would be nice to have a GBA. Could have been like uh, something you could Oh, okay, one more reason to buy a GameCube, but not the reason. See, I would agree with you completely, except Nintendo actually did sell the Game Boy Player bundled in with the system a lot. Yeah, yeah, and so, especially in, the, so. in those, uh, I found a lot of uh, Japanese ones, you usually have a little bit longer box, and they'd have all Precisely, the, uh, precisely. So you basically have to take all of those units out of circulation. Now, I'm, I obviously don't have access to those numbers. So let's say we shave off. I'm going to be generous and say maybe like 2 million units that had a Game Boy Player built in. So we bring the Game Bo the GameCube's numbers down to like 20 million. And that's, I don't know, maybe still being kind of optimistic because that doesn't include the people who also bought it kind of retroactively and pieced it together and all that kind of stuff. But whatever. We'll, we'll say it inevitably would have caused damage to the GameCube because we have to keep in mind the only reason... The only reason Nintendo released the Game Boy Player for the GameCube is because the GameCube was not doing well and the Game Boy Advance was killing it and they thought tying it together would help the GameCube. That was the only reason that occurred. So in a world where it Virtual Boy level fails, the GameCube definitely takes a significant hit. Now, I will not sit here and preach doom and gloom that Nintendo would have gone belly up, much like you. I think they could have weathered that storm. They wouldn't have liked it. And they very likely we would still get the Wii equivalency. Uh, if anything, the Wii probably would have been almost exactly the same. I don't know if they would have made any significant changes to it because it really is just a GameCube they were effectively reselling. Um, as for the DS, that's the next obvious question here. I agree with you. They probably would have tried something else. Um, the DS definitely feels like Actually, to tell you the truth, aside from the Game Boy support or Game Boy Advance support that is in the DS, the DS almost feels like a reaction to the GBA being a failure because it, it uses a completely different type of cartridge. It obviously goes for a whole new mechanism of two screens. So I almost feel like the DS might have mostly been the same minus GBA support. I think you yeah, might be onto something with that because of the um, close uh, ti the ti uh, the time frame of release dates compared like if that was like around 2001 2002 and the other one was 2004 2005 kind of, it's not that big of a gap so it feels exactly like what you just said yeah i so yeah i agree with you and so here's the the x factors in one case quite literally xbox um is what do sony and microsoft do now the psp was largely born of sony recognizing because of the game boy advance that there was a very significant handheld market that they weren't in. Because, you know, they looked at the console side of things and they said, okay, the Sony PlayStation 2 sold 155 million units, which now I guess is closer to 160 for whatever reason, but at the time, 155. And they looked at the GameCube, the mighty Nintendo, who only sold 22 million units, and maybe they crunched some numbers like we just did, and they thought without the Game Boy Advance support, maybe they would have sold even 18 to 20 million. They would have shaved off a few million units. We were so close to, like, obliterating them, and the only thing that really kept them around was this Game Boy Advance. This is a market we should be in, and that's how the PSP was born. So in a world where the Game Boy Advance fails, there's only two options here. Either Sony goes, okay, we don't care about handhelds because, look, even Nintendo is dead in that area, and they just drop it entirely. Or, much like you suggested earlier, 
uh, they go, wow, Nintendo failed. We have a chance to take over that market. And they put out a completely different, yeah, they put out a completely different system, something that's not quite as capable as the PSP would be, something, I don't know, closer to like a PS1 in specs, but portable. Um, I don't know what that system would have been, but uh, that's the only two options I see. Which one do you think is more viable? Well, knowing, uh, well, seeing how something like uh, the PS One started, uh, I, I would I would go for, for the fact that Sony might try to target the market somehow, uh, because if they took the chance whilst Nintendo and Sega were in the market, the sort of the, the big names, and they did succeed, they might. And with their success at that point, especially with the PS2, they might, you know, use all of that influence in order to get into the handheld market. And without Nintendo there, it would make it an easier job for them. Now, since it's an easier job, I, I, I would lean towards something that would not be as technically, you know, as technically strong as the PSP. Probably lower, because they wouldn't have that motive to, to you know, try and be better. But I would still think that they would jump in. At the same time, it would kind of open a gap for for Sony and maybe Microsoft would have even thought of it because without Nintendo there, the big name is gone or the big name is, is you know out of it at that point of time. It would be a good time to strike and you know get dominance in both markets. Okay, I'm inclined to completely agree with your logic, especially the idea of them kind of finding a hole, because that is completely correct. That's how they got into the market in the first place with the PS1. You're, you're, so I like your reasoning there. So you're going with the idea that uh, they Sony probably would have released a handheld maybe in closer to like 2002 um, instead of, what was the PSP, like 2004? I think... I think around that, but I'm not sure. I honestly, but, but it was around the DS know. time, so I'm guessing around 2004 or five, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Well, I like I like your reasoning there. I think that that makes a lot of sense. Um, I don't know if it would have succeeded. Obviously, that's a whole different discussion. But I, I think that your reasoning is sound. Um, yeah, it would so make sense say- that with the logic that you see Sony go, Sony the logic that Sony went by. I'm guessing that would be their move. Okay. Now Microsoft, on the other hand. I don't. Th- I think uh, the reality we're in is also the same one they would have reacted in that. Because keep in mind, so the, uh, I just decided to double check. The GBA launched in Japan in March of 2001. In uh, North America, Europe, and Australia, it launched in summer of 2001. Now keep in mind, the original Xbox didn't. It launched the same year, but not until November. So, uh I think by the time the original Xbox launched, we would already know the GameCube game sorry Game Boy Advance would have been a flop in that timeline, and I don't think Microsoft, who had just entered with their first console ever, would be like, "Oh, let's also do a handheld." I just I don't think they would have done it. I think if they were going to have ever done this, um, at least initially, that the correct time to do it was back in like 2004 when everybody when nintendo was doing the ds and sony did the psp that's when you know xbox portable or whatever would have been you know ideal so i actually think they they don't their course of history basically doesn't change uh with one exception which is that they still allowed rare to develop games for it that's like the one thing that they contributed to the Game Boy Advance is that Rare was still allowed to develop stuff for it because it wasn't seen as a competition to Microsoft. Those games would simply have just never been made, I guess. Um, but yeah, yeah, maybe. I don't, I don't but but there could be a possibility. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe in the so, long run. So, so you're thinking that if it had failed, and I mean, that Nintendo what would have continued to make the ds sort of slightly different sony probably would have made something weaker and the psp that we got may never have existed um but you think microsoft would have eventually done something hearing your reasoning i i would say that yes your reasoning does make a lot more sense given the release dates but in this scenario that nintendo does not save itself so rapidly assuming the whole quote-unquote DS alternative sure. takes sure. takes time. Maybe 
that time frame is bigger than expected so it Microsoft might actually get to that point so it could be a possibility but it, it depends is. on would, it depends on a possibility for possibility uh, yeah no that's a hat on a hat so where I'm going with that too and I agree with you is that um, I think the only scenario in which Microsoft makes a handheld as a reaction to any of this is if that other Sony handheld the not PSP the one that would have come out in 2002 maybe um, if that one had been a success, like monster success the way GBA was, then I could see Microsoft trying it because they were like, wow, we don't want to let them dominate the living room and the handheld market. We have to do something. Um, but that's at best, you know, that's the hat on a hat. That's just too many guesses. But yeah, it's, it's interesting to see. Like beyond that, though, I don't know. I mean, the games that were made for it obviously would be lost to time, you know, whatever. Um, certain titles that, you know, came off of that were eventually released on other collections. And it, it directly inspired things like the Nokia N-Gage, which no doubt would never have been made. Um, you know, stuff like that would never have come into existence. But um, as far as like the major ramifications... Yeah, I think if the GBA had just been this flop where people looked, you know, on it, like if people looked at imagine a world where we kind of look at the Game Boy the way we look at the Wii, like this big successful system. It was around, you know, for a long time and had tons and tons of games. Everybody owned one. It was a massive success. And this thing called the Game Boy Advance was just like the Wii U. It's like, yes, it's more capable. Hell, it may even be better in a lot of ways. Just nobody bought it. Um, and it was cut short. You know what I mean? It could have been, if it had been like that, how does it play out? And I, I think, I, I mean, I think that our assumption is not terrible that Nintendo probably would have relatively tried to move on as unscathed as yeah, with they could. the DS. It's the same yes, thing because the, the, how the DS is sort of innovative, innovative or yeah. whatever. You could think that yeah, the same thing with the, if, if you take it with the Wii U, right? So, so the Wii U and then the Switch is also innovative, right? So, so kind of something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yep, I think I think we agree. And then the sideline effects would be possibly that Sony makes a completely different handheld and tries to kind of get into that market at a different time. I could see that. Things like the N-Gage probably never get made at all. Uh, and then Microsoft only potentially makes a system if Sony's system is a huge juggernaut success. Um, but that's that's a huge what if. Um, yeah, I, I think that's I think that's kind of it for that. So, yeah, do you have anything else you want to say about this? Nope, I think that's pretty much uh, everything I could I could say from my side. Okay, well then, Sinjeet, thank you uh, very much for selecting that, and Abdullah, obviously, you know, for having a subject at all. It was kind of cool to have you guys combine a subject there. Um, so we'll move on to the next and final subject. This comes from Patreon backer Spencer Perrier. Uh, and he wanted us to talk about the future of trade shows and retro game cons. So let me kind of elaborate on this. Um, so right now, at the time we're recording this, this is June, of course, of 2024. In past years, this would be like E3 time. Uh, this is when we'd be seeing all these shows about all the new games and everything. And yes, I know we just had an Xbox conference. I know there's a Sony conference, all that stuff. But his question was basically like, what do you think the future is of those kinds of shows? And then on the flip side, what is the future of things like retro game conventions? Like, I just got back from one in the UK. But before I give my piece on that, um, I'm curious, Abdullah, if you have any sort of perspective on any of this. Okay, so uh, so my answer would be maybe a bit different. Uh, because, as you know, where I'm at, these conventions aren't so common, or aren't so common compared to uh, the US, for example. Um, we do have a Comic Con here, uh, Middle East uh, Film and Comic Con, but, but it, again, it it, it doesn't it doesn't just encompass video games or retro games. It has pretty much everything in that kind of realm: comics, movies, whatever. The way these conventions are now, I'm not talking about retro game conventions because I have no experience in those. Like purely retro game conventions. That that's what I'm saying. I mean, I don't think we have those here. Sure. Uh, I mean that, yeah, that kind of so, makes so sense though, given your history. So, yeah, exactly. So, so that I can't give an exact perspective on, but I, I I might give a guess, and maybe you can you know double check whatever. Maybe some facts I'm not getting hundred percent correctly, but I would compare how cons are 
to generally how the status of uh, you know digital versus uh, physical media is yeah and that's kind of where I see it where people wouldn't really bother for the physical game since the I can just sit at home and download it oh I can just attend this or I can see the announcement online and whatsoever so the conventions tend to die out you could see what what happened to the three right yes of course yeah, so so I, I'm guessing that that's unfortunately it's heading towards more of everything gonna be is gonna be through social media and whatever. Now that's what I would say in terms of conventions. I don't have much to say because even if you like, let's take the convention we have over here, right? So, <clears throat> like if I compare the convention that we had in our Comic Con in 2024, compare that to the one in I would say like 2018 or something. Um. It's so different, and it feels more like you're going into a mall that you could just go to every day. So it's becoming more corporate, and it seems to be losing touch. And that's also one bad aspect of it. So not just that it, it's not just that the digital one, or the 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 ones where you can attend at home or online or whatever, those conventions make it easier to go. You're seeing that the physical ones that do still exist have become more corporate and kind of lost touch of what they were. I, I don't know if I'm, my point is getting there because no, it's no, very you, difficult you're, to. You're completely to, yeah. correct. You're completely correct. Yeah. I know what you're saying. So it's gonna, yeah, so, so it's, I, I see the hit coming from two sides, actually, not just one. The fact that these conventions are getting worse, in my opinion. Um, like, I didn't like the ones that we've had recently. Uh, they've had their good parts for sure, but overall. I felt that it, it lost its touch somehow. Now, I don't know if that could be me, but I, that's not my own opinion. A lot of the, the, the people I've talked to who attended and compared it pretty much at the same thing. It's it kind of lost touch. It's kind of like, oh, we're doing everything because we know that's what should be done compared to when you go back then and the con itself is engaging. So I would say it comes to those two sides of it. Now the last part is the retro games thing because I don't know much about those because I haven't attended them as, as I told you because of the regional differences. Sure. sure. Uh, yeah, so the thing is maybe those would not change as much I'm guessing because they're mostly from the community itself. If you get, if you're trying to get I do. If you, if yeah, that yeah, so it's kind sense. of yeah. yeah, so it's kind of from the community but that one is more public, so it's get got more bigger control. So I don't know. That's the status of. That's what I see it from my perspective. <laughs> you know, being in a completely different region. So to, that's where. To I, be honest I stand. with you, to be honest with you, dude, I think you brought your A game today because that's an absolutely excellent analysis. Um, so I don't know how much better I could have actually said it because the the truth is trade shows you're are, are, you're correct they're basically news events like I mean the, the in the history of them at least from the public perspective the only reason we were watching was not for the song and dance routines it was just to find out what the new games were the original origin the genesis of those cons was basically just to get the press corps together so they could report on what was supposed to be happening and over time with the advent of the internet more people could watch it directly so they had to find ways to make get more interesting then you get the public in there and that's how you had the public attending but inevitably it was just like way too many people did not want to attend it because they could get all the info from it in a single tweet and i know this i went to e3 three times it was fun to go to but ultimately there was no real reason you actually had to be there unless, unless you actually you know were someone working it Right, unless you were working it or if you had some sort of VIP treatment where it was just more fun. But like as a casual attendee, unless you really wanted to spend six hours in line to play a demo of the latest Call of Duty, there really was no reason to be there. Um, especially when that was going to be online in a matter of weeks anyway. So I can see why that is kind of going away. I agree with you. It is a perfect parallel to um, you know digital and physical media and basically saying there's just too many people that are just not interested in going there physically. And that's fair enough. I do think we may reach a point, because we are the nostalgia generation, where somebody tries to make like a retroactive E3 eventually in like 10 years, where it's like, they're bringing E3 back, kind of like Atari suddenly relevant again. Um, and maybe someone will do like a single show that's kind of throwback for everybody who's old enough to remember it. But I, I don't see any great 
uh, potential for trade shows and news events to become like big things. Like, I guess I would compare it to actual broadcast news, like re regardless of whatever you get your news source from, if it's, you know, CNN, BBC or whatever the hell it is, doesn't make a difference. You don't actually go to the channel network to find out the news. You just watch it on their website or their, you know, the TV channel or whatever it is. That's or your phone. You know, that's where you got that. You didn't actually go there. Um, so that's kind of the same mentality. Whereas retro game shows is completely the opposite. If anything, those things are booming. Um, so I was in the UK for the last few weeks. And part of why I was there is I was in uh, a town called Wolverhampton, England, which is near Birmingham. And I was invited to a convention called Revival Game Not Over. Now, uh, I have go to a lot of retro game conventions. It's a big part of my channel and my identity is to go to these things and have a good time, you know, be a guest, bring the Sega Pluto, whatever it is that people want. I like to do that. And those shows always are different and yet kind of the same. And I mean that in a good way because you said it very well. It's they're community driven. It's like the, the people who organize those are literally the fans of that content and so what they'll do is they basically make the show that they would want to attend. So they figure out like, what am I, pa yeah, what am I passionate about? Nothing in a retro game sh uh, show is typically news related, unless you get the occasional, like, like, I know this is a hilariously ironic example, but like when Tommy Tallarico unveiled the, uh, in television Amico at a PRGE years ago. Like that was technically news, but like that's a rarity. Like usually that kind of thing doesn't happen at that because the ultimate point of those shows is uh, you have dealer tables so people can go and buy video games you're basically going into a, the biggest retro game store you know for that weekend that exists um you know you'll have prominent members of the retro gaming community whether they're you know youtubers they're game creators they're you know artists whatever resellers obviously people who are famous for selling stuff online for whatever reason you know um it doesn't make a difference like you, you get kind of all these people who are into the same hobby all in the same building and see what kind of magic happens you know some will do like yes yeah, some do like a museum section um some do arcade sections uh you know sometimes like uh, prge for example portland retro game expo which i maintain is the world's best one uh, they often do like oddities. Um, I know they have some plans for this year, but I can't talk about them. One thing I can talk about and cause they've done it in the past is, you know, the last blockbuster in the entire world is in Oregon. It's only like three hours away from the show. So they've started making it a regular thing where they get blockbuster to set up a blockbuster at the show because it's a perfect mesh of nostalgia with retro games and all that. And everybody kind of wins because it's just like the perfect audience. Um, so some shows do it that way. I see that continuing to expand for a while. But I will also preface it with the fact that we are... You're not really recruiting too many kids into that. So, like, that's on borrowed time, too. It's just that it has, like, an extra 20 years that trade shows don't have. It kind of lives with with the, with its own generation. So when that generation Precisely. is... Precisely. Yeah, I mean, there's one point I wanted to also hi highlight uh, what you said because the, the reason I thought of it in in that way uh, is because when I'm thinking about getting some rare game or something like that, I mean, obviously, from my side, it's very difficult to do so. But I would try to say, say like, okay, maybe there's somebody locally who has it, even though it'd be very difficult to find something like that over here. Now I see that's where the conventions would rise up because that that's where I saw it because the co conventions are community driven, so people come by sometimes for specific purposes and they actually get to you know hunt for things that they want to because it's again it's all from the community to the community, so it's kind of like tailored f for them. So that's why it, it it kind of booms up. So so I see that th there is a, mot a motivation to go. And you have a lot more reason to go versus something like you know news kind of thing where you can just get it online. Absolutely, hundred percent. But also, it's numbers. So like even Portland Retro Game Expo, which is the biggest one, it just is. That's I think the world's biggest retro gaming event. Like people fly in across the world for that. That show, as big as it is, I don't think it even cuts like half the numbers of an average E three because it's it's not meant for the masses. It's meant for the masses of a niche. Which tells you everything. Yeah, you need it's to know. pretty much like 
tailored towards specific group a specific group that what makes it successful but it's not going to be as big as something like that for sure uh, i definitely yeah agree. and it's not trying to be to be fair so um yeah so what here's one thing i also noticed by the way at the convention i was just at and it's it's not just like a british thing like apparently this is happening here too in the u.s um i've done I'm, maybe you've even seen them i've done videos kind of talking about how uh retro game prices kind of go in waves based on demographics like the age of people um so one thing that i mentioned was that right now uh you everybody's kind of looking at xbox 360 stuff and everything because that's all the gen x kids who just are basically getting out of college they're getting their first jobs they have a little money right and they're rebuying their childhood but the second wave of that is when not the generation in front of them because that would be the millennials but the generation before that with the game cubes and the ps no no no, PS2. no i'm not talking about i'm not talking oh, about game talking consoles about. i'm talking about human beings there's gen x there's millennials oh yeah there's, that, that, uh, but I'm, I'm, i mean the, the corresponding yeah. consoles yes and so where i'm going with this is even though everybody's paying attention to the fact that Gen Z, and I think I screwed up and said Gen X earlier, but Gen Z is driving up the prices of Xbox 360 stuff and PS3 stuff and Wii stuff to a lesser extent. People are kind of ignoring the fact that Gen X is driving up the prices of Atari 2600 stuff, ColecoVision stuff, the stuff they grew up on as kids, they are now rebuying. So again... Um, now I noticed this, I, I predicted this in that video. And when I went to this con that I was just at in Wolverhampton in the UK, um, there were a lot of dealers that had boxed Atari stuff and I was kind of surprised to see it. And the prices on it were insane. And I remember talking to this one guy and he's like, Atari 2600, I can't keep it in stock. He's like, every guy, everybody's coming in, buying tons of it. And I'm like, let me guess, are they all in their fifties? He's like, Yeah. And I was like, yep, that makes perfect sense. Because what's happening right now, as far as demographics goes, is all of these kids who are Gen Z, who are the kids of Gen X, you just skip over the millennials on purpose. Um, all those kids are now on their own. They're on the workforce. And basically, they're no longer dependent on their Gen X parents. However, their Gen X parents are still in the workplace, but they've likely paid off their mortgage. They likely don't so have got a lot of money. <laughs> so got... Exactly. And so what are they doing with that? Not yet quite retirement money. I'm going to play back my childhood. That's exactly right. Abdullah. That is exactly right. <laughs> because it, because I'm comparing this to how like things, GameCube prices were a couple of years back because that's what the, the corresponding generation, that's what the millennials were doing. Was. Yeah, yes, that's what and it happened before, doing. and it's now happening with this. It's gonna happen, and, and pretty much if we make the same calculation, maybe you could expect what's gonna happen later. It, it makes perfect oh, yeah. sense. Yeah, it makes perfect. Yeah, this the, correlation makes perfect sense. Yeah, it does. Uh, the thing is, like I've I've done a couple of videos talking on this because I find demographics to be absolutely fascinating. It's like something that people don't pay any attention to, and I don't know why, because it literally defines all of human history and like everywhere we're going and everything we're gonna do. This is interesting it's all based because on actually, demographics. <laughs> it's very interesting because one could actually try and look at the, that data and make it, and there might actually be some sort of correlation. But, but we're not doing statistics yeah, yeah. or something right now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it, it does make a lot of sense. Because mm -hmm. these guys grew up, the parents paid off, and now both can pay. So whatever their corresponding childhood was, and that's what's going to rise up. It makes sense that these two are correlated somehow. Precisely. And keep in mind, Gen X, which is, again, they're in their 50s right now. They are the oldest generation to have ever had video games. Like, that's when video yeah, games were introduced, when they were kids. Yeah, before those, there was pretty much, yeah, nothing. So, so, yeah, the boomers, so you could, you could, the so you boomers for cease. example, didn't have video games. So they have no nostalgia for this. Like, um, so I'm a millennial, right? My parents' generation is the boomers. But when they were children, video games simply did not exist. I mean, I think video games came into the creation when the boomers were all, like, in college. At, at like, the youngest of the boomers. So, yeah, they don't have the same drive that we do. So we'll have to see as time goes on what happens. Like when, I mean, I know I'm jumping way ahead here and I'm being a little uh, morbid, but when all of Gen X is dead in like, you know, I don't know, 50 years from now, uh, when they're all dead, what happens to their childhood toys? 
is how much of it survives, what happens as far as nostalgia, what happens as far as does it just all end up in a museum? I mean, or is it kind of like, you know, baseball cards from the 1840s or something? Like, where just nobody except for, like, the most diehard of super fans even knows what it is or cares at all. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, I'm, yeah I get your point. It becomes a sort of something that who are people who care about history and these things would do it like historians, but not people who are nostalgic because they they don't exist anymore. Yeah, but they wouldn't exist. But but there's also an interesting point here uh, that I myself w- 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 like to, to to observe because kind of like how you see the like this Atari generation. So people who are born in the '80s here, they're 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 nostalgic for things that are. Like, for example, something like the MSX or something like that. Like, sure. I know people who were born in the mid-80s who, who who would be nostalgic for things that are a little bit older over there. So, so that, that, that would be interesting to see because something like that might actually happen here, but not now, maybe a bit later. That's why I said 80s, because those people still, until they reach their 50s, take See, it's. Uh, it I mean, is, if I understand you correctly, you're basically saying because your country got stuff on a different timeline than ours, that people might have a different nostalgia for different things. Yeah, still demographics. Yeah. still do play a right. role, right? <laughs> Precisely, they always play a role. It it really boils down to what existed when you were a child. Um, yeah, that timeline. That's, uh, that's that's pretty much all that it is, uh, and that's that's totally fine. It's actually a fascinating discussion to potentially have because you mentioned the MSX. Keep in mind, the MSX didn't even come out here. So there's no yeah, nostalgia for but, that but, in the U.S. That's a very Japanese. Yeah, but uh, the, the general thing. Yeah, I think it came out here with with uh, with uh, the different name. I think it was called Sakhar, which means like rock or stone. I'm not pretty much sure if I'm sure. not mistaken. But 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 don't quote me on that because I'm not sure. I'm not. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. If yeah, exactly. The there's no. It, yeah, it, there's no inherent uh, nostalgia for a particular generation just because it came out in a certain decade. It happens to just happen when that item existed to a group of people as children. It doesn't matter when they were children. It's just when that item was relevant to them as children. It's just that on average, uh, you're most likely to develop nostalgia for things that came out in your timeline, your existence, not stuff that like, you know, I, I, for example... You know, I was born in 86, so I my, mostly I was playing, like, the Genesis and everything when I was, you know, uh, when I was a younger kid. So I grew up having a lot of nostalgia for that. But there was nothing inherently preventing me from, say, having, like, a, a diehard emotional attachment to a ColecoVision. I just simply didn't have one. It was a system that had long since been discontinued before I was even born. And... I did not possess one. So by the time I got one, I was like in college or high school or something. And it was like, oh, that's kind of neat. But like, there's nothing built into that inherently. However, if I had grown up with it, that would be different. Um, but yeah, we're, we're getting way off topic here. But the point basically we're trying to make is that retro game cons, I think, have much more of a ceiling in front of them simply because we still have a long time before the physical media generation of kids is completely gone like we just said gen x is the oldest video game generation to ever exist in human history they're in their 50s your average human being lasts until they're like 80s now it depends on the country but like 70s 80s um so and you know human beings definitely can survive up to a century i mean like we just celebrated what the 80th anniversary of d-day like a few weeks ago uh which is you know the invasion of uh france from world war ii um and there were war veterans there who were literally a hundred years old so it does happen um point is we're gonna have gen x for a while so if you go all the way down to the youngest generation that grew up on any physical media i think that would be gen z I don't know what the current generation of children is called. I think is it like alpha or something. I don't know what it's called. Um, like, but Gen Z might be the last generation that cares about going to something like a retro game con, just because as we go more and more digital integration, 
there's much less and less interest in having a retro game show with Gen Z still at least somewhat caring about physical media. Um, there is potential that something like a retro game con could still continue to be a functional concept for like another 50 years. Uh, but it will, but that's yeah. Whereas the, the trade shows are pretty much over as it is. Uh, but that said, not that I want to preach doom and gloom, but retro game cons of course are doomed too. It's just, they're, they're, you know, because of their very nature they they get to live a lot longer. That's all. Anyway, any other thoughts on that? No, nothing much, but I, I just want to note, I did just double check it. It is Generation Alpha. It is Alpha. Okay, so I was right. Yeah, like, Generation Alpha, I highly doubt, is going to care about physical media anything. At least, I say this from the, shall we say, Western experience, you know, in the U.S., parts of Europe, etc. Uh, different countries do things at different speeds. So, I, it, you know, it, we'll see. But as a generalization, I would say that's probably about accurate. But yeah, yeah. I, even over here, I can say pretty much the same thing. They're, they're more into the digi everything. Uh, it's digital. It's easy to get. Why are you doing it like this? Yeah. Well, there you go. They, they don't have a, All right. a notion of physical. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, then there you go. I think that's that's good for that. So, Spencer, thank you very much for that subject. Uh, Abdullah, obviously, thank you for joining me, as always. And uh, do appreciate it uh sinjeet thank you as well for the subject Ladmot, uh, of course you too joseph for joining me earlier and of course doing a subject as well as some shout outs from loke michael kelly sega steve and trey wagner thank you to all of you as always guys if you could do me a favor please like this video comment down below subscribe if you've never done that before and check out all the social media stuff in the description twitter instagram facebook discord spreadshirt my travel channel and obviously patreon so that you can get early access to this uh as well as the other videos again you can get shout outs you can pick subjects and you could even be on here potentially if you want to and you can just support me and keep me going here i do appreciate that so thank you as always for watching and i'll see you all later